California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us. Our guest today is Michael Rubio. Mr. Rubio is a member of the California State Senate. And in this portion of our program, we're going to speak with Mr. Rubio about the higher education system in our great state of California, which we know has been under tremendous distress as a result of the state's budget crisis. I recently learned that the state is spending a billion dollars less on the uh, UC system than it did five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the even more startling fact is if you look at the last decade to decade and a half, our priorities have a bit skewed, become skewed in that uh, if you look at the spending per ratio to the California Department of Corrections, there was a time in which we spent $5 to every $1 on the California Department of Corrections, and now uh, we are spending dollar for dollar. Well, as I understand it, and I'm a wealth of irrelevant information, so just <laughs> indulge me if sure. you may. In the 1980s, 70% of California's budget went to higher ed, 3% went to prisons. Today, 9% goes to higher ed, 11% goes to prisons. That's yeah. a flip. And our prisons are overcrowded to boot. You just highlighted the fact of what are the point I'm trying to make. Now, realignment's going to have a, a big impact on that. Uh, secondly, the other driving cost in, in incarcerating inmates is this issue of health care. Uh, we spend. We're under receivership. Oh, it, it, it's federal ridiculous. receivership. But if you look at just the raw numbers, we spend on average sixteen thousand dollars per inmate to provide medical care. If you look at neighboring states who provide adequate care for their inmates, they are literally half that number. But the question becomes, why are these individuals in prison? And many believe they are in prison because they were not provided adequate educational opportunities. You know, it's a vicious cycle. If we don't provide an opportunity for someone to be a law-abiding citizen. Right? We've got to educate them, we've got to train them, and we have to have jobs, quite frankly. Uh, the other uh, issue that we haven't talked about often in the legislature in this particular year is the need for jobs. That is, if there is a silver bullet in any of this, once you get educated, once you're trained, you've got to be able to get employment so that you can provide food for your family. But the challenge becomes, for those that do go to college, because the prices are increasing so much, the debt burden is literally overwhelming, and we know people are having they're, they're going bankrupt because of their student loans and yet those loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy a whole other conversation oh, it is. but let's focus on the UC system mm -hmm. uh, many believe that it remains a crown jewel in our great state but the prices are going up higher than any other system in the country and you are concerned about those that are enrolling in the UC system Talk to us about the ratios that we are seeing in terms of enrollment. I am, and thank you for bringing it up. If you look at not only the increase in fees and tuition, there's a trend now with the regents at the University of California to now enroll at a higher rate out-of-state and international students, and we all know because they pay more uh, than in-state students. And it's alarming on the fact because if you look at just last year alone, 43% uh, of the those who were enrolled in UCs uh, there was a 43 percent increase rather uh, of out-of-state students and what that essentially does is it provides for those who are competing outperforming state uh, university or state students the ability to get a chair or a seat uh, in those UCs. Is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean I think about California's geography from Cal from Los Angeles to San Francisco sure. is the same distance between Washington DC and Providence. A lot of uh, very uh, you know, rich, diverse cities along the eastern seaboard. I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing to have geographic diversity come into our state. I mean, if we're all, you know, 90% Californians, you know, where's the global view? I would say two things. First, for those families and those parents who have lived in California for decades, they've invested hard-earned tax dollars to build the campuses, build the intellectual capacity for these wonderful flagship University of California schools like Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Diego, so that it can be a state system. They're not going to be able to have a front of the line position to get into those schools now, even when their children are outperforming well, the out-of-state students. So student. let's talk about your proposal. Sure. Right now, the UC regents have a policy they do. that they will create a system whereby 90% of all students system-wide are Californians. That's right. 10% are out-of-state or foreign. The policy is just that, a policy, and right now I think the numbers are around 12% mm -hmm. system-wide. You are looking to write a constitutional amendment I am. to mandate exactly what? 
to mandate that their standard, the 10%, isn't uh, statewide or system-wide rather, but it's per each university. Uh, I think it's common sense. If they say the standard ought to be 10%, then it ought to apply to every university in the system. Whereas UC Berkeley today is 30%. One in three students is an out-of-state or international student. But let's think about some of the other outstanding institutions around the country sure. that are state-run. Uh, University of Michigan, mm -hmm. University of Virginia, University of Colorado. They have about 30% out-of-staters. Sure. And those systems run very effectively. It's a tremendous geographic melting pot. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of our friends went to Michigan or sure. went to Virginia, Colorado. Sure. And I don't know. I just really wonder whether the answer is to limit enrollment. I think the question is this. Do we want brain drain to occur in California? Because the stories, well, let me tell you the, the real life stories that I'm being told. Please. The parents are calling and saying, I have got one child four years ago, got into Berkeley and UCLA. I have a second child four years later who uh, has gotten better grades, uh, more competitive in terms of test scores, did more extracurricular activity, got waitlisted at Berkeley and UCLA, and now they're going to Cornell. That child would much rather uh, be here in California. But are they not getting in because of out-of-state admissions or because we're decreasing enrollment due to the budget crisis? I would say it's the first because what we have found is that uh, President Udolph and others He's the are president of the UC shifting system. the business model to lure and recruit more out-of-state students. And the question is, do we want to become a private university or keep it a state-run university? do you blame him? I mean, honestly, think about it. I don't blame him, but we don't take any other resource. Look at the investments we've made in water in energy, in any other resource. We don't then take that resource and sell it to the rest of the country. We use that resource to benefit and create a competitive advantage for California. What about this? What about creating um, a law, a constitutional amendment, whatever it may be, which would allow the cap to float based upon the budgetary status of the state? Sure. Because at certain times, we just may need more out-of-staters to help fund the UC system. Let me ask the other question because it has not been brought up. How about we look at the cuts that the regents are making in the layers of different bureaucracy they have within the University of California system? There are chancellors to a president, to a president, to a president, to a vice president. Well, well, so so I would ask... Efficiencies, fine, but there are efficiencies throughout state government. Oh, but we're only talking about the University of California yeah, system. There you have now, it. Go uh, so if we're going to examine in this I would make the argument that this 10% standard that they've set, I didn't set the standard, they did. But you are changing it. Absolutely. You are, it, Absolutely. it's a bold move. I mean, it's because a very- I think we ought to fundamentally keep the University of California system a state crown jewel. If we are not careful and we don't set this cap, then it will soon become a private university system well, what about by, by definition. I mean, you talk about a brain drain. Mm -hmm. You know, let's bring some of the best from Florida in and they'll stay here. It's oh, a brain absolutely. lore. Absolutely, absolutely. But if you're capping at 10%. Here's the, here's the tr uh, struggle, though. We know we don't have broad immigration reform. So if you take an international student here to get on a student visa, that, that is a good, then they a leave. Then they leave this nation. And so you talk about brain drain in that seat so is being occupied international. Yeah. And so they're occupying a seat that a valedictorian from California could otherwise occupy, and then they leave this nation. You, I don't know if you know this. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff is looking at that very issue. Good. He's from Southern I California. He, I hope he moves forward on this subject. So between that and my provision, we would really have a robust Call Adam future. Schiff you have a chance. We'll do I that. do want to get a sense of where we are on this proposal because sure. I'm. I'm sure that there's a lot of support for it. Oh, we've got a number of co-authors, uh, and I'm proud of the support the sponsors asked me a step forward. Those are the workers that actually, they're the janitors, they clean the university why do system. Why they care? I don't mean that pejoratively, but sure. why do they care? They're parents. They want their children, the ability to go to these fine institutions for which they're cleaning the toilets, cleaning the classrooms, they're making so sure they run. So is this a ballot initiative, or no. is this a, it's a oh, It's a constitutional amendment, which will then go before the voters either in 2012 it or 2014. It would have to go to the voters. It will have to go to the voters. And so are you collecting signatures now? Where are we on this? We don't need to collect signatures if we pass through the legislature with a two-thirds vote. And so we have until the end of June to make this November ballot. Sure. If not, we'll have to go to the ballot in 14. His name is uh, Michael Rubio a member of the California State Senate. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with a member of the California State Assembly. His name is Luis Alejo. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition. Which public university charges the highest tuition for out-of-state students? Pennsylvania State University, the University of California, the University of Illinois, or the University of Michigan? According to a U.S. News & World Report 2012 survey, 
the University of Michigan charges the highest tuition rates for out-of-state students. Seven UCs made the top ten. It's California Edition. Welcome back. We are speaking with Assemblyman Luis Alejo. He represents uh, portions of South San Jose and beyond. And I want to speak with him about an area that so many young men and older men enjoy, and that is mixed martial arts, which is exactly what, Assemblyman? Well, mixed martial art, now known as MMA, right. is the, one of the fastest growing sports in the United States. It now has surpassed professional boxing, professional wrestling. It's televised in 130 countries. But basically what it is, it's, it's a full combat sport. Um, so you, you could um, see a fight where there's a kickboxer fighting a, a wrestler, somebody who specializes in jiu-jitsu. It's not choreographed. It's not like WWE, for example. Not at all. This is um, no holds barred, basically. A lot of different martial arts coming together, and, and the best person wins in the end. Um, the sport has really evolved. It first came on national television back in 1993 uh, with very little rules uh, of the sport. And now it's, it's just grown, um, become so popular that it has a, a very strong following here in the United States. And what's interesting, when you think about boxing, for example, you think about Nevada. Nevada kind of is the hub of professional boxing. What I didn't know until you told me is the hub of MMA is not Nevada, but California. Right. Last year they had about 100 um, MMA um, professional fights, and the number keeps growing every year. Um, sold out crowds, whether it's in San Jose or Southern California. Um, and with that comes, you know, a lot of ticket sales, a lot of pay-per-view sales, uh, merchandise sales, so it's uh, rapidly growing. And you're a big fan of MMA, I, I take I've, it. I've been a big fan since the very beginning. Are you a um, fighter? Well, no, I wasn't a fighter, <laughs> but in high school and in, and college, I was a, a team captain of our local wrestling team, placed in the state championship. So as a young wrestler, it was, it was a Surprised. sport that you naturally gravitate to. Right. And you become a big fan since day one. But here's the challenge, and it's almost as if MMA is growing up just like uh, WWE grew up, which is there's not a lot of protections for the fighters themselves. We heard five, seven years ago there was a lot of contention between WWE and their athletes. Now that exact same thing is happening today with MMA. The athletes are feeling as if they are being exploited, they are feeling powerless, and they don't know where to turn, but right. they're turning to you. Right, and, and um, um, I'm carrying a bill, um, AB 2100, and it's basically trying to create the first ever ethical uh, standards, professional code of conduct for the promoters um, uh, in this sport. But it also prohibit, you know, exploitive provisions and contracts for the fighters um, because what doesn't exist in MMA fighting is um, other sports have their own professional leagues, right. associations for the players. There's that, no union, right, I there's take no, it. There's no union association, and but basketball has it, professional baseball has it, um, boxers now have it, but there's no, there's no, no such association of its kind in MMA fighting. So you're looking to regulate the industry. We'll talk more about the specifics of your proposal, but I want to ask about the fact that this will be a forerunner. Calif as, you know, as California goes, so goes the nation, or maybe not. And if California passes this legislation, could not the promoter simply say, oh, well, California won't be our state. We'll go to Nevada. And as a result, California will lose a, a significant revenue source because the fights won't happen here. They'll happen in Nevada. Well, the same argument happened when they passed the national, the federal Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act because of the same types of abuses within the boxing uh, sport. Um, but you can but see federal boxing is law. It's, it's federal. But as you said, here in California, it's the first of its kind. Eventually, I can guarantee it will be the national standard. But here in California, it's the largest market. There's over 35 million people. Some of the biggest fights have happened here in California, and the sport is only thriving within California. In states like Connecticut and New York, we actually prohibit MMA fighting. Oh, really? um, the, the opponents actually have been lobbying hard in those state legislatures to open it because there's a big market in states like New York. They would love to have uh, MMA fights happening at Madison Square Garden as well. Um, so th that's not the case in, in, in where states that had prohibited it, they've been fighting to open those doors in those states. So let's talk about what your bill does specifically. And I really want to drill deep because, you know, we, we think that people who are on television automatically make a lot of money. I can tell you that's not true. And, you know, you're watching these MMA fights, but the reality is, is that these um, fighters, these athletes are not making a living because of the way you say these contracts are drafted. Right. So first of all, some of these contracts, they get 
paid very little. You're talking about the new fighters, the young fighters, the lower level fighters, they get paid very little. This is an expensive sport for your training, your team, your traveling expenses. Sometimes for a fight you get almost very little, not even to pay your training costs. But I guess what your concern is not so much that people have to grow into higher salaries, but they get locked into long contracts. Right. And they are deemed to be exclusive to a certain promoter, which means they cannot work with another promoter. Is that really what you're looking at? Right. So even or if it's unfair, it's a take it or leave it um, a mentality right now within the sport because there's such a discrepancy. Um, some of the promoters control about 80 to 90 percent of the industry and so when you're a young fighter and you're trying to get your first contracts it's either take it or leave it and some of those contracts just to give you two examples Please. for example it's like a merchandising agreement which would um, which would sign away a fighter's um, the rights to their likeness their image their name in perpetuity For meaning life. forever right is that even legal and, I mean and, I, I used to be a lawyer you're a lawyer can they isn't there a seven-year rule I have a it, vague recollection of that not in MMA fighting you know really? and so some of the fighters it's either take it or leave it and they and if they walk away it's hard for them to even get another fight when the promoters control so much of the industry uh, I read about this from you there's a champions clause this is is quite surprising right so if you, if you get a, a contract, and at the end of that contract, you become the national champion, um, now the same terms um, would be extended. It's an you, you automatic would, extension. Uh, automatic extension. Aren't you, you supposed to be able to renegotiate when right. you get big? Especially, yeah, when you're a big name. You know, usually when you become a world boxing champion, you're able to get the benefits of that because you become the world champion. That doesn't exist in MMA with these types of provisions being put into the contracts. Well, let's talk about the challenges in terms of getting a bill like this passed. I presume that the promoters have very high paid lobbyists swarming the halls of Sacramento across the street. Uh, so how, tell me about the status. How is this bill going? I can't imagine it will be easy to get out of the legislature. Right. Well, well, the opponents, of course, have hired a, a pretty strong team of, of folks to oppose this bill as it's, go, it's gone through. But nonetheless, we've been able to get it out of its first policy committee. It's headed this week uh, through appropriations committee. We've included amendments to address any, to lower any cost that w would apply to the state to make sure it gets out of committee. So we're pretty confident. We got a good momentum and support for the bill, but it's certainly not it's Needed, and I'm going to keep uh, fighting for this bill until we get it um, enacted into law. Well, what's the governor say? Because in the end, he has to sign the bill, and you know it's interesting. The governor really doesn't get involved in legislation. Not just this governor, any governor. So you can spend all this time on this bill, and he could just veto it. But can you do any pre-lobbying with the governor's office? Right. We've, we've been, been in contact, and we're going to continue to be in contact with the governor and and with uh, members of the assembly as it goes to the full debate on the floor. Same in the Senate. But um, basically, California has led on a lot of areas in terms uh, in boxing. In the 1990s, we had greater, more stringent standards than any other state in, in the country. And I think it's time the sport has got to a level where we could take the next level. It's evolved. Uh, not, now it should include some fairness and equity in its contracts as well for its fighters. How did this issue come to you? I know that you're a fan of the sport. But why is Luis Alejo the, the key promoter, if I can use that well, term, well, of this, this bill? An interesting story. Um, ESPN did a documentary. They have a program called Outside the Lines. They did a documentary going into um, MMA fighting to find out what's happening within the sports, what's happening to these young fighters. And as they started um, interviewing folks, it, it turned out a lot of fighters were even afraid to speak, um, fearing that they would be blackballed from getting another fight. But then um, also they started looking into what's happening with the contracts and then fairness and looking at what happened with the Muhammad Ali, Ali Boxing Reform Act, that those same protections for boxers do not ex ex uh, extend to MMA fighters. So I have researched it. Have you spoken it. with any promoters? I mean, have you tried to get some of them on board? Well, we've been open. We've been meeting with, uh, when you carry a bill like this, you, you always have your door open. Look at all points of view, see where you can make adjustments. But at this point, the opponents have said they just don't think it's necessary at all, have been willing to uh, negotiate, and even look at other, other ways where we can have this move forward uh, together. What about federalize the issue? But that, that would be the next level. Um, and, and same as in California, where we had the first discussions of creating the national standard for boxing, it eventually did become federal. I think the same is happening with MMA. We're having the first discussion here in California and eventually get to that point as well. So we'll know this year if the bill goes? Yes. It's a one-year bill? It's a one-year bill. So uh, again, if, uh, if, it does, if it doesn't move forward this year, there's always next year. You'll but we're back. confident we want to make it happen this year. And hopefully you'll be back on the program. His name yeah. is Luis Aleo, member of the California State Assembly. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Assemblywoman Shannon Grove, she is mixing it up, no doubt. She is calling for the California legislature to go part-time. You won't want to miss our discussion with Shannon Grove. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on California Edition.
In what year did California vote in favor of creating a full-time legislative body in Sacramento? In November 1966, California passed Proposition 1A, creating a full-time legislature with 73.5% of the vote. Welcome to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us. Our guest is Shannon Grove. Shannon is a member of the California State Assembly, and she is trying to shake it up in a big way in her first term. There have been lots of calls for reform in Sacramento, and Shannon no doubt has one of the most bold, and that deals with whether the legislature should be full-time or part-time. Exactly. What does Assemblywoman Grove think? You know, um, I've only been here 18 months, but I really think the system is broken. So when I started looking at research um, about the past history of the state, we used to have a part-time legislature. I met with uh, Governor Perry, and I've also of talked Texas. of Texas, and I've also um, l researched other legislative bodies in different states, and come to find out there's uh, 44 other states that have part-time legislatures. Let's, let's talk about it, because no doubt it's on the minds of California voters, uh, whether Sacramento is working, and we've heard this proposal floated. I mean, you have been very public about it. I want to kind of push you on it, though, and, and try to figure out how it would work out. Okay. If we consider that California is the ninth largest economy, if it used we used to be fifth, that's true. Okay. Uh, it's it's it absolutely true. Fifth. Yeah, and we got to figure out why. Full time legislature, yeah. it's gone with you know the self inflicted paper cuts that have driven business out of the state. It's uh, it's uh, gone to ninth, but, almost ready to go to tenth. But. Is the way to do it to keep people out of Sacramento for such a large economy? I mean, is that going to be the most efficient and effective way? Texas has a large economy. Florida has a large economy. There are 44 other states that have a part-time legislature. So what about the concern that if we do have a part-time legislature, that it will only embolden and make the executive branch more powerful? Because <laughs> the, the governor will be there full-time, and the 120 members wouldn't. What can he do if we're not there? He can't pass legislation if we're not there to pass it. He can't, uh, you know, there's things that have to, all three branches of government have to be involved in order for the government to function. But, um, but if you think about it, and again, I'm just, you know, playing right. it out. If you think about it, though, the governor, the executive branch, has a lot of power generally. They have the executive agencies, and they can sign executive orders. They can do a lot without the legislature. And if the legislature isn't there looking over his or her shoulder because they're part-time, a lot of mischief could be done, one could argue. You one could argue that, but 44 other states have a part-time legislature. All of those 44 other states are better economically than California. Think about it. California used to be first, and now we're worst economically. We used to be first in education, now we're last. So the in bottom some line, measures, yeah. in some measures, yeah. and, and but the bottom line is, is that 44 other states do this, including Florida and other states like Texas, which are large land masses. Here's another question: um, When you think about who runs for office um, today. They are people who are able to change professions, for example. You, for example, have a business and you are able to run for office. This is a full-time job right now. If the legislature is part-time, there's a concern who would be able to run for part-time office. The wealthy, Anybody the retired. But, but I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, let's say I'm a lawyer. Let's just say, for, for example, I'm a lawyer. A lot of legislators are lawyers. If I have a practice, a legal practice, I can't take time off my practice to go to Sacramento for three months. It's a maximum of three months. It's not a full three months. It's a maximum of three months. And when you consider all the time that's wasted, like right now, the May revise came out, and we're billions of dollars and $15.7 billion in the hole. And we're passing bills off the floor yesterday that are coupon month. Okay. There's a lot of oh, time there, on your wasted no on your right. hands if you can come up with coupon but, men. But who but it is a concern. Who will be able to run? I mean, you have the blessing that you anybody, have a functioning business. Anybody that can run that runs now. You really think though? I mean Absolutely. Let let's say you you're a teacher. You know, okay. there are a couple teachers in the legislature right now. They couldn't do this. They they couldn't be a teacher 
and a legislator at the same time. They have to leave their teaching profession and be a full-time legislator. But it wouldn't be full-time. It's a maximum of 90 days. Right. But the teacher, for, unless it's over the summer, how would a teacher become a member of the legislature? Well, it's a maximum of 90 days. They'd go through the election process just like anybody else does. When they come up here, they'd set the legislative council or the legislative schedule. So the legislative schedule... But would the schedule, schedule be over the summer? It depends on what the legislative body decided to do. It'd be a vote of the legislative body. What about lobbyists? That's all, what we hear all the time. With term limits, lobbyists are very powerful because there's no institutional memory. Um, if it's a part-time legislature, lobbyists will be very powerful because they'll be there in tw 12 months and the legislators wouldn't be. Well, I, um, I was looking at things to defend that statement and the only thing I can say basically is where's their million dollars to qualify the ballot measure if they're going to be in so much power? Meaning, meaning, played out. Played out, meaning that if it's going to give them so much power, why are they not helping make it work? Um, they don't like it. Lobbyists and legislators don't like this bill. Now, it pulls very well with the Cal California people. Very, it, it very is. Well. I mean, I have it seen is, polls, and there's no doubt. It pulls of, at a super majority. Yeah, uh, that the numbers are rising. Absolutely. No doubt. Um, where, so where are we on this proposal? It is bold. I mean, Assemblywoman, this is where you are really mixing it up. Well, um, it's, it's, we're gathering signatures right now. We have till July 1st to be able to get all the signatures that we need to put it on the 2014 ballot. We're You're well going. over halfway there. Uh, Ronald Reagan, this, or excuse me, Ronald Reagan's son, uh, Michael Reagan, sure. has come on board as the chair. Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, Forever. endorsed it uh -huh. um, on the Newsmax interview. In any way, will the part-time legislature proposal um, interact with term limits? Are you going to look at term limits as well, or the term limits will stay however they are, and this is completely separate? It's a separate ballot measure. Term limits will stay as they are, and then it would just be part-time. A maximum of 90 days instead of roughly $150,000 a year pay, meaning $95,000 for Plus the per diems. Plus per diem right. and all the perks. Then it would take it down to 18000 which is double the amount of Texas and triple the amount of Florida. We're the highest paid legislators in the nation. Is that bad? Why? Well, you, you, fair enough. You know, some would argue you get what you pay for. And well, okay, throw that argument back. You pay us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. And what are, what we, are getting? we doing for the yeah, state? What are the citizens of California getting for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per legislator? They're getting the highest unemployment rate almost in the almost, nation. Yeah. We're almost forty-eight. Minutes, 48. Yeah. So we're almost the highest unemployment rate, and we have all the natural resources plus our oil fines, plus the Balkan shelf, plus everything that we offer in this state. But could it be that? I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but the way we tax, I mean, you know this as well as anyone, our tax code. Our it, tax code, the regulatory mm -hmm. process, not allowing for us to access our natural resources that we have available to us. Um, so the bottom line is, is that when you say you get what you pay for, the citizens of the state of California pay us $150,000 a year. What are they getting for that? They're getting somebody who is actually up here part-time. Seriously, we're up here on a full-time basis, but your committees... If you add up all the time you spend on committees and all the time that you spend on the floor, you have 13 minute floor sessions. If you add all that time together, 55% of your time, 55% no? of your time is spent outside the building um, raising money to keep your job. Well, that's, that um, we know for sure. You know, so how is that a service to our citizens of the Cal how, how is that a service to the citizens of California? Well, what if uh, um, assembly members, for example, had to run less often, maybe four year terms, like the Senate, because you don't have to raise money as often. That's an option too. Right, right now, I you know with single source subjects on ballot measures that dealt with a part time legislature, and we set up four uh, four actual key issues: ninety days instead of nine months, or a maximum of ninety sure. days. Limit the time that they're here. Limit the pay. Limit the time. Oh, the three months. The, right. the three months. Mm -hmm. So limit the pay to eighteen thousand instead of the roughly hundred and fifty thousand right. with the salary plus per diem, and then. Um, not allow them to be appointed to a state board or commission afterwards. They have to go home and live or go someplace and live under the rules that they create. They can't make a deal for five years. Five years. They mm -hmm. can't make a deal or whatever they do and then get appointed to a state board or commission for $150,000 a year. You I mean, are you just have to pushing live. the envelope. Live I under the rules that you make and give us a two-year balanced budget. The citizens of the state of California deserve a two-year balanced budget certified by the treasurer's office and the state controller's office. Just between us, no one's watching right oh, now. Yeah. What That's are your what you say. Exactly. <laughs> what are your fellow members saying? Um, you both know, sides of the aisle. Both sides of the aisle. I haven't got a lot of support from either side of the aisle. Um, Assemblymember Martin Garrick was very, very favorable. A towards Republican it. member. Yes, um, Mr. Uh, Donnelly was very favorable, Republican, and yeah. so was Ms. Halderman. But um, oh, also, other than that, there hasn't been anybody that has come on board. All I can say is Shannon Grove, you are mixing it up. I am so glad you are 
creating the conversation because it is a conversation that we must have. We have to. And please come back. I really want to have you back on the program again. Thank you. Okay? Thank you, Brad. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching California.